My name is Emilian Chubuk. I am a security consultant here at Security Consulting. And I, uh, I quite like cloud. Um, especially, I speci well, I specialize in Microsoft Azure solution. But as part of uh, our day-to-day -day job, I do do quite a lot of different types of engagements, ranging from you know, cloud security configuration reviews um, to purple teams, maybe shifting a little bit more left towards um, sorry, uh, architecture reviews and everything in between, really. So before diving into it, I wanted to give a big shout out to my boy Chris here. He was my partner in crime with, uh, you know, for this research project. So all right, let's, let's give it a start. So we, we do hear and read uh, you know, in the news every day that there are a lot of different types of uh, compromises in the wild, right? Um, we, we see organizations' tendency to move their infrastructure into the cloud. And therefore, parallel to that, we see attackers moving their attack techniques into the cloud, right? So I wanted to give um, two uh, examples of that. First of all, the Holmium attack. These guys are also known as the APT Group 33. Now, they, for example, were able to uh, leverage a couple of quite interesting attack techniques, cloud-based attack techniques, to uh, compromise uh, an entire network in just under a week, right? The other type of attacks is this uh, living off the land type of attacks, which is uh, basically leverages um, legitimate functionality of uh, you know, services and products uh, within the cloud, but for nefarious purposes. In this case, for example, there was, a, there was an example of um, Azure Compute uh, VM extensions, which were, you know, you can use these for things such as um, CI CD pipelines, um, sort of like scripts that you want to run after deployment or anything like that. Now, these are benign, uh, benign purposes, but they were leveraged for uh, malicious ones. So this combination of, um, you know, techniques in the clouds and uh, legitimate functionality uh, leveraged for nefarious purposes goes very well hand in hand with what I want to talk to you guys about today. So, our agenda. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit about Azure AD service principles, hence the name. Uh, we're going to be talking about what they are, uh, what their purpose is, but more importantly, their purpose within the security context in, uh, in a cloud environment. We're going to look at some tooling, Azure Storm Spotter and Cypher Queries, that can really help us um, have a more visual uh, way of identifying potential attack paths within our environment. We're going to look at some attack scenarios and also uh, a bit of a live demo on how to exploit them, kind of half, half live, half video demo. And then finally, uh, a bunch of points on monitoring, detecting, and preventing these types of uh, attacks and how can we go about that. So to start off, what do we need to know for the purpose of the talk? Well, understanding Azure AD. It is an identity provider, but also an identity and access management service in the cloud by Microsoft. And what you can have in Azure ID is you can have identities, think about them as your users, groups, um, service principles in, the terms of, uh, in terms of uh, service accounts, applications within the cloud, other cloud identities if you uh, link your Azure ID with other um, networks, and so on. Now, these identities can have roles assigned to them. Think about them as permissions within the cloud, permissions for various um, you know, components within your estate and, and things to do uh, to them. And finally, service principles are basically the um, accounts that get created to represent these non-user identities. So with non-user identities, I mean applications, for example, right? Things that aren't directly related to user activity um, or, or user logging in to the, to the tenant. Okay, but why do we care about these uh, service principles in the cloud? Well, think about the numerous possibilities that applications in the cloud offer you. You might have you know, storage space, such as Box, Dropbox, or other applications like that. You might have um, applications such as Office 365 for your documents, and your employees can work and manage those documents. You might have you know, services such as Workday or Salesforce, right? So in Azure, your apps will be registered, right? Think about that as a unique definition for the application, sort of like a class in object-oriented programming. You then create an instantiation of that app within your tenant in order to be able to use it. And then a service principle gets created for that application so you can, you know, it, it can be represented by the, by the service principle. All right, but why do we actually care about these service principles, right? Well, there's a little bit of a problem with them. In, in general, uh, people tend to focus, you know, when talking about uh, security, people tend to focus a lot about the user uh, accounts, right? And not so much the service principles. They tend to be a little, bit, uh, a little bit overlooked. Now, on one hand, the development side of things, you might have you know, all of your developers, you, they, they might have their agile stints, 
um, they might uh, really need to push for a, for a finished solution at the end of the, 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 the cycle. Um, and therefore, they want to focus on security, but they also need to have that working solution at the end of it. So you might end up having service principles for those apps left uh, a little bit too overprivileged. On the security aspect of things, though, from, from our point of view, whenever we do an assessment, um, we, we, we oftentimes focus a lot more on the components and the infrastructure bits, but not so much on the Azure AD side of things, right? And service principles are mostly part of that. Um, Azure AD, you know, it, it may be left as a kind of like uh, time-boxed exercise at the end of the, ex uh, the assessment, or sometimes not even included in the scope at all. So that's a problem. Um, and there's another aspect. Uh, when you onboard uh, an E3 or E5 license into your Azure tenant, um, you get about 300, uh, more than 300 applications onboarded into your tenant by default. And these are applications that can be both um, Microsoft native ones or third party ones, but they get there uh, by default. Now, there's a very, very uh, good piece of research from a researcher called Dirk Jan. Uh, and what he was able to do, he basically created a list of all of these applications. Um, at the time, there were about like 200 plus. And he was able to find out the uh, Microsoft Graph API permissions that were automatically set up for each of these applications, right? And he managed to put together a list of the, more, uh, the most interesting and, and potentially problematic ones, right? Well, as we're going to see in a, in, a, in a little bit, nowadays, two years later, uh, the situation is a little bit different. Uh, as I, we had to basically uh, do the exact same thing again to see what, the, what those permissions would be nowadays. And we, find some, we found some pretty interesting things. But about of that, uh, you know, enough about uh, theory, let's get into the, the more juicy bits. So we have some attack paths that we've, uh, we've identified, right? Some potentially uh, privilege escalation related uh, attacks that would allow us to start from a, from a compromised uh, low privilege user or relatively low privilege user and then make our way up uh, to something a bit more uh, interesting like, for example, a global admin. Okay, so say we have compromised an application administrator. And in Azure, the app admin is effectively the user role that allows us to um, fiddle with application, modify, manage them, and also manage their service principles. So we compromise our application admin, and then we want to do some more recon. We look for the types of applications that exist in the tenant, and we find a couple of interesting ones, maybe some native 0365 ones, maybe some uh, customer custom ones. Um, and uh, we find, we look for those that have uh, interesting and useful to us um, permissions, graph permissions. For example, maybe something like directory read write all or something along those lines. Okay, so then we move on to the next step, the principle, service principle editing. We want to uh, assign it a password or a certificate in order to log in as it. Why am I saying that? Well, service principles in Azure don't start with credentials. They are not meant for that purpose. So if you add a password certificate to it, then it means that you want it to do, to perform some kind of action with that uh, service principle. All right, so we, imp we impersonate it, we log in into our uh, CLI uh, tool of choice, whether that is uh, PowerShell or the AZ CLI in Linux, and we are now effectively uh, operating with the same level of privileges as that application that we've compromised. So okay, that is bad, uh, but there's more to it. Uh, the fun doesn't stop here. Let's say we, as the same attacker, we compromised an application in Azure AD. And the problem with that is it's not really what we wanted. It doesn't have any interesting or dangerous permissions. It's, it's quite benign, right? So that means that we cannot really do much within the tenant. We cannot compromise other identities or anything like that. But that's okay, because uh, in Azure, apparently, your uh, custom created applications and their service principles have contributor access, therefore read write. Uh, to the Azure resources in the subscription in, in which they have been deployed. So that is pretty bad because, for example, if we were to um, you know, have, for example, some, uh, some nice VMs in that um, subscription or perhaps something more interesting such as um, a, a key vault with some secrets, then with contributor access, we will have access to that as well. So talking about tooling, well, when, when you want to identify these potential uh, attack paths and escalation paths within your environment, leveraging uh, useful tooling that can help you do that is something very uh, important and, 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 and you, something that you should really do. So StormSpotter is one such tool. Uh, this is created by the Azure Red Team uh, people. 
and it leverages Neo4j graphing capabilities to give you a more um, you know, visual representation of the components within your tenant uh, and also the relationships between them, right? And you use cipher queries, which is sort of like a, you know, think about them as an SQL-like uh, sort of statements that uh, allow you to query those components and the relationships and to see them in, an, in a nice graphical way. So enough of that, let's look at a demo. And to start with, I wanted to give you a demo about StormSpotter first. And uh, this is the uh, StormSpotter uh, interface, effectively. On the left-hand side here, we can run a query. In this case, what I'm, uh, what I'm doing is effectively um, listing all the contributor and owner relationships and what components have them. So here's the output. Now, usually this appears on the, on the top part, but it's in the bottom now. We see here a subscription called Testing Cradle. On the left-hand side, we can see a bunch of users and the contributor access that they have to that subscription, all right? And then we also can see on the right-hand side, for example, the resource groups in Azure uh, that this subscription contains. Okay, so that's cool. What else can we see? Well, we can see user groups and the members, but also the members that have uh, ownership permissions over the group, we, we see that as well. And then finally, we see something interesting up here, something called global admins, also a user group uh, that has the global administrator role within Azure. All right. So if we give another query to our StormSpotter uh, instance, let's see something a bit more uh, related to the actual demo that I wanted to, get, to give. So we see here a group called production owners that have owner permissions over the subscription and therefore, as we've seen uh, just previously, the resources within it. But we also have that nice global admins group uh, that we've seen earlier. So these might be potentially interesting, right? We do a little bit more recon within our, within our tenant, and we find out that there is a, um, an account called automation account. Uh, we can very nicely expand upon it and see that it, is, it represents basically the automation account application within, uh, within Azure AD. This automation account is mostly related to things such as uh, CICD pipelines, and of course, by design, it does have some uh, pretty interesting um, and elevated permissions. So, what if we try to compromise it? Let's go to the uh, video part of our demo. So here, uh, we're starting as an application admin, right? We assume the compromise of an app admin, and this app admin, as I said, it's a regular user. It doesn't have any global admin privileges or anything like that, um, and it, it can just manage the uh, service principles and the applications. So we want to start fresh, so we remove them from the global admins and the production users. So um, in order to have absolutely no uh, particularly uh, elevated privileges. So what we did is we created a tool, a tool that can do this automatically for us, this attack path. We log in as our app administrator from uh, PowerShell in our tool. And what it asks us is um, to give it a, uh, an object ID of the group that we want to try and, and get ourselves into. So we give it the group ID of that production uh, account uh, users that we've seen earlier. So what it will try to do, it, uh, it asks us uh, what service principle we want to use, and we will give it Office 365 Exchange Online, and we'll see why in a bit. Do we want to set up a new authentication method? Well, yes, because we want to attach uh, uh, a secret to it. We give it a secret of our choice. This is a secret that we, we can decide. And what it will do, attempt to do in the background, is um, basically create the service principle for Office 365 Exchange Online, uh, attempt to attach that client secret to it, and then using that, those elevated privileges of the, um, of the account, uh, get ourselves into the automation accounts group. So with a little bit of luck, we should see that uh, we managed to do that. We can now go into our Azure uh, portal, refresh the session, and see that now we, we are part of the production owners. All right, that's cool. But things don't have to stop there, right? We want to get to global admin. So what do we do? Well, we refresh our CLI se uh, session. We log in again so that we have the newly acquired uh, privileges. And we will attempt to do the same thing. First, we look at what kind of key vaults we have in our subscription. Now, of course, for the purposes of this demo, there will be a secret that gives us access to the uh, automation account. So we get that secret, and we run our tool again. Um, now, this time, however, we, we, log, again, we, we log in again to, with, with our app admin uh, role, and then 
we will attempt to use, we will give it the uh, object ID of the global admins group, because that's the one that we're targeting, and we use the automation account for which now we have the secret. We don't want to set up a new authentication method, we will just put in the, the, the secret that we got from the, from the key vault. And with a little bit of luck, uh, in, the, in the background, the tool will uh, get us into the global admins uh, group. And that is quite powerful and important, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you guys in a little bit uh, also why. So we refresh the session, and we see that we are also part of the global admins. So getting back to our presentation. Now, you might think, okay, that is pretty bad, and it is. Uh, we've seen that we were able to actually use one of Microsoft's applications, native applications, to elevate our privileges. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, you know, you, you can see the Office 365 Online uh, account in there, and you see that it has the group read-write-all uh, API permission. Um, now, think back to when I uh, told you guys about uh, the Dirk Jan research in 2019. There were a lot more applications back then that, uh, you know, you were able to query their, um, their graph API permissions and, and see what kind of privileges they had. Nowadays, obviously, it's, uh, it's a little bit different, and that is because it appar you know, apparently Microsoft have uh, acknowledged the problem. Uh, they have tried their best to minimize these applications, and so 99% of all of those 300 plus applications that I mentioned at the beginning, nowadays you cannot really leverage that to, to, to perform this kind of exploitation. Out of those, just a very, very small handful uh, still uh, were able to, to um, list their privileges, and these four are the ones that can, you know, nowadays be uh, leveraged. So that's good, obviously. It, it does show some effort from Microsoft, uh, from Microsoft's side to mitigate this. So let's talk about what can we do to prevent these kind of problems. And we will have the user account side and the service principle side. From the user account's perspective, well, we need to really apply the um, uh, sorry, defense, uh, defense principle for uh, least privilege. We want to use custom roles in order to tailor very, very specifically the roles that you want to give your users so that you minimize as much as possible the potential for gaining privileged access that they don't need. And so you want to, um, for example, focus on um, services, security services such as Azure Privileged Identity Management um, that allow you to give users time-bound and uh, limited access for whenever they, they need to perform some uh, you know, elevated uh, action and then revert back to a low privilege state. Uh, also, you, you need to you know, at attempt to leverage as much as possible the security uh, features that Azure gives you. For example, by default, any user, when you, when you set up a new tenant in Azure, any user has the ability of registering brand new applications and also consent to apps. Consent to apps in this case means effectively giving uh, application, assigning applications um, those graph API permissions that I mentioned. So you want to focus on what roles you want to give to your, to your users. So in this case, the app admin or the cloud app administrator are the ones that can be leveraged for these kinds of um, application management um, sort of actions. And the app developer is the user that is able to create brand new uh, applications if they wanted to. So yes, uh, do try to leverage uh, uh, privileged identity management. Uh, MFA, as always, try to implement it uh, at a minimum to your administrative uh, roles within your tenant, but you should aim to apply it to everyone, all of your users within the tenant. And then finally, conditional access policies can also really help. What is interesting is that service, well, Microsoft is, uh, is working, apparently, on conditional access policies also for the service principles. So you could, for example, restrict logins as service principles from just uh, you know, um, predetermined geographical regions or IP addresses, uh, things like that. And that can really, really help with the granularity that we need to, uh, to achieve. Service principle side, well, again, sir, the principle of least privileges. You don't want your SPs to have uh, uh, too elevated of an access. You want to assign only the graph permissions that they actually need for whatever they need to operate on. Um, you want to also, though, focus on the resource side of things, right? We've spoken about the contributor access. Most of the times, they might not need it. Of course, you might have, again, automation accounts that by design, as part of the CICD pipeline, they need to be able to perform some elevated and, and more, um, you know, more, more dangerous actions within your tenant whenever they're, they're setting it up. However, um, 
this, the, the purpose of this talk is also for raising awareness because most of the times, when, like I mentioned, when you, when you create uh, service principles and the applications for them, uh, the, the contributor uh, value is set up by default. But you can do that even as part of, a, even as part of your CI CD pipeline, you are able to set parameters to your command line uh, argument, as command line arguments for your uh, PowerShell or Azure CLI um, API commands and make sure that contributor isn't assigned but a more uh, a lower privilege one is. And finally, you do need to focus on regular logins because sometimes you might want to elevate the privileges and then come back to a lower privilege one or you, you might have a whole bunch of service principles that get, get created without you even noticing them. So regular reviews to see exactly what is uh, present within your tenant are crucial. But let's talk a little bit about uh, detection and monitoring, right? Well, this is a bit of a tricky one because these actions are allowed by design, right? So it can be difficult to detect these sort of um, uh, the, uh, malicious presence, right? But the good news is that your uh, existing telemetry and, and logging capabilities can probably help you at least to a certain extent. And we'll see that in, in a bit. So you want to set up some alerting policies, but you want to focus on the service principle and not just the users, right? Coming, going back to what I uh, said in the beginning of this talk, your users are the ones that, uh, you know, yes, most of the times may be, uh, may be compromised, but a compromise of a service principle is also an indication of uh, a user rather than a service or an application doing some sort of nefarious stuff and, you know, there, there's that user presence in there. Um, and then, yes, the other reason why this is uh, difficult is because um, service principles for Microsoft application, for the native ones, um, do not log sign-ins. Uh, you are able to see signings for uh, any custom apps that you might have in your organization, but not the Microsoft ones. So I wanted to give you guys a, a couple of uh, queries for uh, detection, right? These are Azure Storm Spotter um, queries and you can run these within your uh, StormSpotter instance to kind of get an initial idea about what components exist in your, in your uh, tenant, what are the relationships, and where could potential attack paths exist. So to, get, to give a couple of examples, the, uh, the first one here, we're looking for app administrator and cloud app administrator roles and see what, where they are, who they are, and what kind of components they, ha they might have access to. Um, here in, in, the, uh, in the middle, we are looking for any contributor um, roles for service principles or applications. Therefore, that would allow us to list the apps and service principles within our tenant and to see uh, what, what kind of components they might have access to. And then finally, for example, the last one here is the one that I've used in the demo at the very beginning. Contributor and owner privileges uh, to see which users have them and what components they have them on. Whoops. Here, I wanted to show you a couple of custom query language detection queries. Uh, this, uh, you, you, can, you could run these in, um, in software such as Log Analytics in Azure or uh, directly in Azure Sentinel. And they can also help you start getting a little bit of an idea of where a potential compromise might have happened. Now, the first part, the first, uh, the first detection query, this one focuses on custom apps. That is how you can see sign-in logs for custom applications within your tenant. And that's great because you can actually see the logs. Uh, the second one is related to Microsoft's uh, first-party apps. Uh, yes, there is a detection query for sign-in logs, but you don't see the sign-in logs in the way that I've explained it to you. Rather, the identity parameter here will show you um, users, actual user uh, accounts that have logged in to that application. So for example, someone who's just signed in to uh, Office 365, but you will not see the Office 365 service principle signing in because someone has compromised it. And then finally, this is the, the most important uh, detection query that I wanted to, to showcase. This one focuses more on a, on a layered approach, right? You, you start with a couple of initial filters where you want to look for any sort of activity that is related to these service, uh, service principle credentials that we've, uh, we've compromised. So you will, look for, uh, you will look out for things such as adding or removing or editing the service principle credential, whether it's a key or uh, um, a certificate. Uh, and then once, you've, once you have some telemetry about those uh, actions, then you might start thinking, okay, let's see what has been compromised. And here, for example, you can filter by identity 
we've used the Office 365 Exchange Online, and we can start looking for more, uh, more interesting actions, such as adding a member to the group, uh, such as in our case. Obviously, I'm by no means a SOC analyst. I don't have all the experience necessary for, for these, but I believe they are some good, um, interesting starting points, and I'm more than happy to, to get some feedback from, uh, from anyone that knows some more on how to even improve these. So if there are three main takeaways that I want you guys to, uh, to take from, from this talk is that uh, service principles are very much uh, an existing and interesting attack vector that uh, is present and can be leveraged. Uh, we have seen, obviously, Microsoft uh, applying some, um, you know, some mitigations to, to their applications and trying to reduce this, but you really need to be on the lookout for service principles as well, and therefore, you want to look for human interaction. Uh, on them. The second one, you need to really lo uh, look out for your potential targets of compromise. Tools such as Stone Spotter can really help with that. You want to, there to, to look for the, the cloud admins or cloud application uh, admins uh, within your tenant. And also, on the other hand, you want to really pay attention at the most critical resources that you have, right? Remember again the, uh, the key vault? or you know, potentially storage accounts, anything like that that holds sensitive information, that's going to be a target for the attackers and therefore that's where your focus should be, uh, should be headed towards as well. And then finally, really, really understand that the prevention for, for these issues isn't, uh, isn't an easy task. Um, you, your, your existing capability can help you a little bit. You can write some, you, you can and you should write some detection queries for these specific cases, but what you want to do is build up your defenses in a layered, uh, via a layered approach. Uh, therefore, putting more barriers to an attacker, even if they do compromise your uh, environment, uh, they, they would have a lot more obstacles that they need to, uh, to cross in order to actually exfiltrate data or uh, seriously compromise resources within your tenant. Um, on this last point, um, my colleague Chris and myself have actually wrote a paper uh, on not focusing necessarily just on the Azure uh, service principles, but more on how to harden and, and really improve the security posture of your Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure uh, tenant from a more holistic uh, point of view. So not just Azure AD, not just service principles, but how to start from the beginning as you enter the cloud space and, and sort of build up on your uh, security capability in order to reach uh, a decent level of maturity. So um, actually we have a, 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 a quite a bunch of, um, uh, of those printed out for you. So if you, if you guys wanted to, to check those out, um, it can be hopefully uh, you know, useful to, to anyone that wants to enter that.